Well, today we continue in our series of sermons about the greatest king of, of Judah that ever lived, a king by the name of King Hezekiah. As we have talked about, we have had a, already had uh, five sermons about him, but his name in the original Hebrew meant the eternal strengthens. He certainly, would, uh, without a doubt, was the greatest king that Judah ever had. And uh, he lived 200 years after his great, 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 uh, you know, I've talked about how that it takes a lot of grace to go back, his great, great grandfather, King David. And he was a man that really lived in probably a very, one of the most stressful times of Israel, or actually Judah's history, because at this particular time, as you study the history that takes place during Hezekiah's reign, we know that the Assyrians had already began ravaging the northern part of Judah. They had come in, and we know that uh, the wall cities, whether they were wall or not, were not able to stand up against the might of the Assyrians. King Sennacherib, we know eventually, you study the history, they eventually that uh, Judah will fall about 606 B.C. But we know that before that happened that uh, actually King Hezekiah was able to get him into a check for a while. And we know that he was a man that God brought on the scene at this particular time to bring great spiritual revival to Israel and to Judah. And he very much at that particular time, as I mentioned, he had his neck in a noose. And he knew that they had gone into captivity, that Judah was going into captivity because of their sins. As we've talked about, his father, King Ahaz, was one of the wickedest, wickedest kings that ever lived. We know that uh, as Hezekiah grew up, he saw the slaughter of his own brother, and perhaps even uh, other brothers as well. And as we've discussed, that probably was a great factor in the, in the, the hatred he had for evil and the great love that he had for God's way. But to go back to 2 Kings 18, just in review, because I know some of you are just kind of coming aboard on this series. 2 Kings 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, king, son of Hosea, son of Allah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old when he, was he when he began to reign. You know, what a responsibility it had to have been that the, that the responsibility, the rulership of the king of, of the entire nation of Judah rested upon his shoulders. But 25 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. We know that Abai is, a, is a actually a contraction of Abijah. It meant the YHVH, or the Eternal, is my father. And certainly, we know that uh, f f all that we can see that she was the daughter of a prophet. And certainly, she was, uh, looks like we may be getting up on a live stream here, but it looks like that she was a great influence in Hezekiah's life, and that she was responsible for the uh, spirit of, of uh, he had to study the Word of God and, and the desire he had to be righteous. So certainly she had a, a very impressionable influence upon her son. But there's this singular telling remark here about him, but he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David, his father, did. You know what? What a remarkable circumstance this had to be that after Wicked king after wicked king after wicked king had been reigning over Judah. And this horrible king comes up by the name of Ahaz that closed the temple down, closed the, the worship down at the temple, that uh, brought idolatry all throughout Judah. And here was King Hezekiah, the great, 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 like I've said, it takes a lot of grace to go back, about 10 generations back to his grandfather David. And uh, he was what many would call a second David. 
And he removed the high places. And he broke the images and cut down the groves and, and broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense unto it. And he called it Nehushtan, which meant just a piece of brass. And he realized that uh, though God had used that as actually we know it's symbolic, actually points to Jesus Christ. But, uh, you know, the serpent, the, the one who would be li lifted up like a serpent in the wilderness, we know those prophecies that would take place. But he realized that like the worship of the cross today, that it was being misused, it had been turned into idolatry, and so he destroyed it. And he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that other, after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Was he greater than his father David? Well, I don't think it's real, that's what the scripture here is really telling us because we know that his great grandfather David was king over Israel and of Judah, but certainly uh, he was a second David. You know, all of us need role models. We need individuals that encourage us in, in this race for eternal life. And I think certainly in King Hezekiah we have a tremendous Tremendous role model, exemplar of, of, of righteousness, a man that we can look to as a role model. You know, certainly it tells us in Revelation 5 and verse 10. I think most of us realize that we are called. We do have a calling. And it speaks of this calling in Revelation 5 and verse 10, where it talks about how, and speaking of Christ, has made us priests and kings and we shall reign on the earth. So we know that all of us here today, we are called to be kings and priests. And it's important to understand that uh, in order to do that, of course, God is using this lifetime, this brief period of, of window time in our life to prepare us for that. And we will see that King Hezekiah will be to us a great role model. I, I, I think as we study this man's life, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable what a tremendous role model he was, what a great example he was of a, of a man of faith. So as I mentioned previously, you know, he, me and many theologians call him a second David. And why was that so? Why was he called a second David? Well, I think today, We'll find an answer for that when we get to the end of this sermon. But God made a particular statement about David, a very sim singular, unique statement that's only made about one individual in the Bible. And many times we have a hard time getting a grip upon this, why this is so. And we read about that over in Acts, the 18th chapter. Or actually, excuse me, Acts 13 and verse 22. Acts 13 and verse 22. And we find this distinctive statement that was only applied to David. And it tells us here, and when he had removed him, he raised up, speaking of Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will of this man's seed has God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior Jesus. So we know, and as we study this, we're going to see certainly Hezekiah was an uh, ancestor of our, of our Savior, as was his great-great-great-grandfather David. But why would God make this statement that I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. You know, at times I think some have a hard time getting a grip on that. Because, you know, you look at King David's life, and certainly without a doubt he was a great king. Tremendous man, the one who defeated Goliath. And uh, tremendous history. But we also know that what stops many people when they read this many times, why they wonder why David would be called a man after God's own heart, was that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
uh, he wasn't a man that had quite as sterling a history as, as was Noah or Enoch. Men who was said walked with God. And we know that he in turn caused the murder of Uriah the Hittite, her husband. And then we know there was another great mistake that David make, would make over in 1 Chronicles, the 21st chapter. And we read this particular account here. It tells us uh, 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1, and Satan, you may want to make a note of your Bible. You know, this is the first place in Scripture that the word Satan is used. The word in the Hebrew comes from a Hebrew word, Satan, which means an adversary or an opponent. But it's striking that this adversary of God's people, this is the first place he's mentioned, although, of course, we know he certainly had great influence from the beginning of, of man's history, but here particularly called Satan, stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, we know that a couple different considerations that took place here as to why this was so wrong. And we know that all the Israelite males that were to, they were to number Israel, they were, were to be redeemed with silver. But we know so that obviously that David was at this particular time showing a distrust, less distrust in God and in trust in the power of man because he wanted to know how large his army was, how large his, his nation was. Even Joab, his great general, answered in verse 3, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be, but my Lord, the king, are then all, not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this? Why will he be a cause of a trespass to Israel? Isn't that amazing that even Joab his general, he knew this was wrong. But David bowed his neck. He, Satan caused him to harden his heart, obviously, and he caused the numbering of Israel. What was the play? What took place? And notice here in verse 14, 1 Chronicles uh, 21 and verse 14, so the Lord sent a pestilence or disease upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And we know that the story, the account here, that God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem and almost destroyed it, but didn't because of his mercy. Uh, what do you think it would be like if you'd been a mother of one of those 70,000 men in Israel? I think at that particular time, if you'd taken a opinion poll, uh, he wouldn't have scored too well if he'd have taken a, a public opinion poll at that particular time. If, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you can imagine how David must have felt knowing that he had caused 70,000 of those men to lose their lives because of his, of his transgression. But yet, he's called a man after God's own heart. Well, when we get to the end of this sermon, we'll find out today. I think we will see the sermon. We will get there. We'll find, uh, be able to get to the reason as to why God would call King David a man after God's own heart. And we'll certainly see why his great-grandson uh, Hezekiah was also a man after God's own heart. So let's go back to Second Chronicles. We're going to back up just a little bit, back up into uh, chapter 30. I'm going to have to get some more water up here. I, I uh, spilled a water cup when I first got up here. I'm trying to get hooked up. I, those of you who uh, may be listening uh, via the telephone, I've got a kind of like a white collar uh, hookup uh, with a Bluetooth hookup. I told Rob we're going to be men in the collar now. My <laughs> wife's shaking her head. <laughs> what was that? She's telling me to do something. She wants me to look a little more polished here. So. Okay, we'll back up here just a little bit to Second Chronicles, the 30th chapter. I mentioned just some of what we concluded with last, last sermon. Second, Second Chronicles 30. 
And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah. Isn't that a remarkable that here we know that northern Israel had gone into captivity long before that, 721 B.C. But, but uh, here's Hezekiah, and he sends a message up to northern Israel, to the remnants that still lived up there. And wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the feast unto the Lord God of Israel. Isn't that something? What a man he was, what a king he was, because we know that in the, after the reign of Solomon, how Jeroboam had led northern Israel uh, and transgress God by not coming up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and by keeping the Feast of Tabernacles in the eighth month. But uh, he encourages them to come up here to keep the Passover in the second month. Well, we know what happened. And uh, you drop down to verse 10. So the post of these runners, of these uh, couriers that were carrying these messages, 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 10, passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laugh them to scorn and they mock them. But nevertheless, uh, different ones of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came down to Jerusalem. Well, what a wonderful time they had. And some of these individuals uh, humbled themselves and they came down to keep the feast. I mean, I, I don't think we really understand how remarkable this was. All these uh, decades and decades, hundreds of years, they had not kept the feast, and all of a sudden you have a king on the scene that's even asking his, his brothers up in northern Israel to come down and to celebrate the feast with them. And the, and the Lord, uh, in verse 21, uh, and, the, and, and the children of Israel that were present in Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spoke comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. Boy, that's such a wonderful, a wonderful uh, statement here. The good knowledge of the Lord of the Eternal. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep another seven days. And they kept the other seven days with gladness. You know, uh, you know I mentioned recently in, some, in a remark I put up on uh, Facebook to an individual that was believing the feast days had, had, had been done away with, that people who have never kept them, they don't understand how joyful they are. And... Uh, we see that here, the blessing that is upon God's feast days. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and a thousand sheep. And the princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks and ten thousand sheep. And a great number of priests sanctified themselves. And all the congregation of Judah with the priest and the Levites and all the congregation that came out of Israel and the strangers that came up out of the land of Israel and that dwelt in Judah rejoiced. What, what, had, to, what, what that had to be like? Their brethren that had long ago quit observing the feast days or observing their feast days with them, their ancestors. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Then the priest and the Levites arose, and they blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up unto his dwelling place, even unto heaven. Whoa, how God does bless his people when they, when they turn around. We get now to the 31st chapter of Second Chronicles. You know, I asked myself when I, when I was reading this particular chapter, it really hit me. And I thought, boy, if only God's church, if only we as God's people could come to have this kind of spirit and fervency for the things of God, how I could turn things around. I don't think there's anybody who looks out at the church who doesn't see that the church is very, very sick in many, many ways. Could it be changed? Well, certainly it could. And we're going to see 
just how tremendous having this fervency of spirit, the changes it can uh, cause to take place in God's people. Second Chronicles 31, we'll be spending most of our time here today. This is about 726 B.C. Excuse me, about 626 B.C. And when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out into the cities of Judah and they break the images in pieces. Uh, these were actually pillars, idolatrous symbols. And they cut down the groves, the Asherah, these sacred fertility uh, symbols that were erected. And they threw down the high places and the altars out of all of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and also Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the men of the children of Israel returned every man to his possession also to their own cities. That's, that, that, that too is remarkable. I mean the, the holy vengeance they had to, to right what was wrong and idolatrous. Now why was that? Well, obviously Hezekiah had made it very clear. He was able to bring this knowledge to his people, made it very clear. The reason that your northern Israel went into captivity, the reason part of our nation of Judah has gone into captivity, we're going to go into captivity if we don't make some changes because of our wickedness. And he had still with them a great fervency and an urgency, we had better get busy if we're going to save ourselves. So they had this vengeance, they had this urgency, they had this drive to remove the, the wickedness, the idolatry from their nation. Now, you know, uh, I was thinking as I was reading these words today, I, I was a little earlier, I thought, well, you know, uh, we would want to, wouldn't want to do that in our nation, we go to jail. I mean, if we were to go into all the, uh, all the, <laughs> the church, churches of our land and, and tear down all the, uh, the pagan symbols and the uh, uh, idolatry that's take, it's in our nation, well, we'd probably be, th be thrown in jail. I, years ago, we had a, uh, uh, one of our members had a, a young boy that was, was, uh, had some physics, mental handicaps and uh, I guess he'd been listening pretty, pretty intently to some of his messages on Christmas. And we were meeting down at Windrock, and uh, right after one of our meetings, he went through the uh, Windrock, started tearing down some of the Christmas decorations. This was Coronado, excuse me, Coronado. Started tearing down some of the Christmas decorations. Well, that, that didn't go over too big. <laughs> so, I mean, it was humorous, but in some ways it wasn't humorous. But uh, they had, these Israelites had this vengeance to get rid of all of this idolatry in their land. And Hezekiah appointed, verse 2, the courses of the priest and the Levites after their course every man according to his service. We know of course that the King David had divided the Levitical uh, priesthood uh, up into three different courses of service where they would rotate in their service. And so Hezekiah reinstituted this. The priest and the Levites for burnt offerings and for peace offerings and to minister and to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the tents of the Lord. And he appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings to wit for the morning and the evening burnt offerings and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths and for the new moons and for the set feast and as, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priest and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. He wanted to make sure the Levites were provided for with the tithes and the offerings of Israel. And it is really inspiring to know that the great love and devotion that King Hezekiah had to the Levites and the priest. And it was said in his reign that there wasn't anyone ignorant about the law all the way from, from Dan to Beersheba. We of course didn't know that was the southern and northernmost part of of Israel. It was said that he opened up the schools all over the, all over the land of Israel that for the study of the Torah, for the law, that, that, that he actually provided oil for illuminating purposes so they would be able to see. He was very much a type of Christ, as, as was David, his father, his great-great-grandfather. 
And so he encourages them to, to be great students of the law. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in the abundance of the first fruits of the corn and the wine and the oil and the honey and of all the increase of the field and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of the oxen and the sheep and the tithe of the holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God. And notice this is a remarkable statement, and he, and he laid them there by heaps. I mean, they were bringing in so much that they were laying them there in great heaps. And in the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps. Now, this was when? That was the third month that had been around Pentecost. Grain harvest, first uh, the consummation of the wheat harvest. And they finished it then in the seventh month. That was the month of the Feast of Tabernacles, so all the way from, from uh, way back around June till about October. And when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people of Israel. I mean, they, he came out there and he saw all, all that people had brought and he was just blown away. And he blesses and he praises God. I mean, I mean, you start seeing this zeal for the things of God you, you hadn't seen for a couple of hundred years. Isn't it remarkable what a great leader can do? the influence that leadership can have upon his people. You know, it tells us over in Proverbs, the 29th chapter, Proverbs 29 and verse 2, Proverbs 29 and verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And here they had a wonderful leader. I, I certainly don't have any problem you know, uh, with, with a uh, uh, one-man rule, if, if it's a good rule, I don't have any problem with that. If the church had someone, one man who had a great deal of uh, input and great deal of uh, uh, import in the church, and he was a righteous man, I have no problem with that. Because that's what took place at this time. And we see the opposite, haven't we? We see what leadership, how destructive it can be. How it destroyed a whole church organization back in the 90s. It dismantled everything that church had ever worked for because of bad, wicked leadership. Obviously, the adversary had allowed to get into power. But here we see the opposite. And when Hezekiah saw, he, he, you know, he says he, and the princess came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people. And then Hezekiah questioned with the priest and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, of course we know that uh, the priesthood had been changed during the reign of Solomon from Abither to Zadok. Answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house, the Lord, we've had enough to eat and have left plenty, for the Lord has blessed his people and that which is left in this great store. Wow. The fervency they have for the things of God. Now, this is not, uh, this is not a, a sermon about tithing and me trying to encourage people to give more. It has nothing to do with that, believe me. But it's the fervency and the zeal that, that is shown here uh, that comes bleeding through their obedience that is, is what is so remarkable. And that notice what God says here. Malachi, it reminds me of Malachi 3 and verse 8. And he says, and will a man rob God? He said, yet you have robbed me, but you say, where have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Obviously, that, that, had been, that had been taking place in Judah and Israel. But notice what, notice what happens here. It's so... It's so Reminiscent of what took place during the time of, of um, Hezekiah. He says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. 
And pre prove me not now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, and there there's not, shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, it's so reminiscent of what took place here in Judah, the land of Israel. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, and in verse 6, the Lord, well, we'll just take time to re read that unless I misquote it. But it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, and verse 6, But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, and a word there in the Greek actually means a hilarious giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you have in all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. Well, we see that's what takes place here. Because it said in verse 9, Hezekiah questions the priest and the Levi ask concerning the apes, I mean, where did all this stuff come from, you know? And notice what he says here. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we've had enough to eat and have plenty, for the Lord has blessed his people. And that which is left is this great store. So we see that blessing because of their obedience. And then Hezekiah commanded to prepare chambers, or these were storehouses, as in the house of the Lord. And they prepared them. I don't know if they've been done away with or not, or whether these were, were new. All of that are new here, but uh, Hezekiah realized that they had so much provision, they had to have storehouses. And they brought in the offerings and the tithes and dedicated things faithfully, over which Kananiah the Levite was ruler, and Shemael his brother was the next. And then it talks about these individuals that uh, at the commandment of uh, Hezekiah the king and Azariah the ruler of the house of God in verse 13. And verse 14, and Kor the son of Imna the Levite, the porter toward the east, was over the free will offerings of God to distribute the oblations of the Lord and the most holy things. And next to him were Eden, and Mena, Men, and Jeshua, and Shemaiah, and Amariah, and Shemekinah, and the cities of the priest in their set office to give to their brethren by courses as well as to the great, as to the small. Beside their gene genealogy from of the males from three years old and upwards, even unto what the ones that entered into the house of the Lord, his daily portion for their service and their charges according to their courses. So it's, what's taking place here is they're simply making provision for the Levites and their families. Both to the genealogy, verse 17, of the priests by the house of their fathers and the Levites from 20 years old and upward and their changes, charges by their courses and to the genealogy of all their little ones, their wives and their sons and their daughters, through all the congregation, for in their set office they sanctified themselves in holiness. And also the sons of Aaron the priest, which were in the fields of the suburbs of their cities. In every several city, the men that were expressed by name to give portions to all the males among the priest and to all that were reckoned by the genealogies among the Levites. So it's simply a matter of these Levites were, be, were being provided for so that they could do their job and their work and what they've been called to do uh, there uh, at the temple. But notice now we come to the end of this chapter. This telling remark about Hezekiah. In verse 20, and thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and he wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God. Good and right and truth. That was the kind of ruler he was. That's the kind of ruler that would cause, and did cause God's people to rejoice. And in every work that he began in the service of the, of because of the house of God. Notice this. And in the law, 
And in the commandments to seek his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. See, that's the answer. That's why King David was called a man after God's own heart. Because everything he did, he did with all his heart. When they brought the ark into Jerusalem, it tells us, most of us remember the story of how David uh, threw aside his outer garments and danced, danced, danced mightily before the Lord. Because he was a man of God's own heart. He was a, a man of all heart. When he went out to defeat Goliath, he went out because he was a man of all heart. Everyone else was recowing back, and they were, they were cowards, and they were afraid to go out there and face Goliath. But David had this great burning love for God. It's a great faith in God. I remember one of the presidents of the United States, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, they remarked about him, how he, he was a man of all heart, a real man's man. But here was really a man of God. More than a man's man, a man of God, King Hezekiah. And it just it says that every, he, he did it with all his heart, and he prospered. You know, it tells us so reminiscent of, of what takes place when this man came to Jesus Christ and tried to uh, put him on the spot, tried to... Uh, uh, fool him and thought he had an answer that was, I thought he had a question that was going to uh, cause him to slip, and make himself look foolish. But there was a lawyer, this was actually verse 35, Matthew uh, 22 verse 35, this is a, one of the scribes that was supposedly an expert in the law, obviously he wasn't too much of an expert, came, came asking him a question. <laughs> Tempting him. Probably had a sarcastic, leering look on his face. I'm going to put one over on him, see if he can answer this one. He says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus quotes her out of Deuteronomy. Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And with all, with all your mind, this is the first and the great commandment. And that was what David, the kind of man he was. It's the kind of man that Hezekiah was. That was why he was second David. He had this same burning love that, that uh, caused him to do all that he did. You know, it tells us in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, Deuteronomy 6, and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And that was an encapsulation of King David. That was an encapsulation of Jesus Christ and Hezekiah. And, you know, you, you look at the situation with Christ's parents that left him there in Jerusalem, didn't realize he was not traveling with them. And you have to, you have to cut that some slack there because it was a, a common practice back in those days. The women would travel by themselves and the men would travel by themselves. And probably they got together and compared notes and Joseph probably thought, thought uh, Jesus was with Mary and Mary thought Jesus was, was with Joseph. And he wasn't there. And they went back and he said, well, where did you expect? You know, Jesus Christ said, where did you expect to find me? I mean, he was there with the, with the uh, scribes and, and, and the teachers. And he was, they were discussing the law of God. That's, that's where his heart was at. That's where his mind was at. I remember when I first began uh, attending God's church when I was 18. And we had a lot of teenagers, some teenagers in the church. And I'll tell you the truth, I really did not hang around the teenagers that much. I, I enjoyed the older people because in the church, 
they were mainly my friends because, I mean, they're my, they were, their minds were on the things of God. Most of the teenagers, they were kind of a bunch of airheads. They were on the things of this world and having a good time. I had no interest in that. Because what we should be interested in is the things of God, the things that really count. And that's what Hezekiah was. Yeah, I imagine as he was growing up to maturity as king, and when he saw the way his father acted, he probably thought, boy, when I, when I take over as king, there's going to be some changes. He hated his father's way. Obviously with a passion. So something certainly I think as the Passover draws near, as the Lord's Supper draws near, time for self-examination, we need to ask ourselves, do I really love God with all my heart? Really? Is this something I'm, I'm holding back? Does he find heaps and heaps of good works and righteousness in my life? You know, it tells us in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor th or rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's more than your finances. It's everything you do. All of your life, what is referred to as alms, good works, righteousness. I mean, what are we, what are we laying up for the future? I, you know, even when you lose an animal like Jet and I did last week, uh, it still reminds you how temporal life is. And you realize that this life is so fleeting and, and there's nothing, uh, the impermanence of life is is so telling is I mean what's what's real is God's kingdom what isn't real is this world out here this ephemeral transitory world that that uh, someday will be just like a dream but are we really loving God with all our heart you know it tells us in Revelation the second chapter Revelation 2 in verse 1 Revelation 2, in verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This, we know this symbolic of God's church. Christ walks all throughout his church. He examines us. Uh, he knows what is in our hearts and minds and our, in our actions. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how that you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles that are not and have found them liars and have borne and have patience. And for my name's sake, you have labored and have not fainted. But he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. He, he didn't see that fervency and that love for, for God that he had seen in his people initially. And our God is a jealous God. He, he's a consuming fire. And when he sees our minds being drawn away from something else, by something else, then he is a very jealous God. He says, remember there from where you are fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, will remove your candlestick out of his place, except you repent. You know, when I remember when I, I first came into God's church, 18 years old, first began attending. Uh, I grew up in Los Alamos, about 100 miles north of here from Albuquerque. But I, I remember the fervency that our church had when I first started attending. Uh, we would carpool. Uh, generally, uh, one or two families would come down and the rest would come down with them. But sometimes we came down three times a week. 
come down for spokesman's club, come down for Bible study, uh, come down for uh, spokesman's club, come down for Sabbath services, Holy Day services. I mean, we thought nothing of it. I mean, as I look back now, I thought, you know, we didn't think anything of it. We just did it. And we enjoyed every bit of it. I remember uh, uh, me and Mr. Henry and his, fa his daughter, we, a lot of times we'd be singing all the way back home. I remember that. I still remember Mr. Henry. He did a great rendition of uh, Cattle Call by Eddie Arnold. And we would sing and rejoice, and we were happy. And I look back at, at, at the fervency the church had of people that, I mean, it was almost unthinkable you wouldn't attend the Feast of Tabernacles. You think anybody would have thought back in those days of, oh, hey, I'm just going to take my, my family out somewhere for a little get-together somewhere instead of going to the feast, which we see in our time. I mean, we wanted to be together. We had a fervency and a zeal of wanting to be with God's people. I remember families would pack their their uh, uh, men would pack their families into their cars with a couple hundred bucks, and sometimes they would sleep in their cars, and uh, uh, you know, you'd take their food with them as they traveled, and, and they would uh, a couple hundred bucks, and they'd make it. it we'd be down there at Big Sandy with ten thousand people, twelve thousand people, and the, the joy we had at the feast, and it was, and there were sacrifices, but we, I mean, it was. Because people, there was this fervency that was there that I just don't see today. Some don't even show up for Passover. Uh, some uh, don't even have a desire. I mean, they want to uh, go somewhere, some uh, resort area, and have some kind of pseudo feast. With the, uh, and I mean, to me, it's just it, it's it's telling. It's lame. It's just it's not what God intended. I know there are circumstances where people cannot keep the feast. That's not what I'm talking about. At least cannot attend medical health problems, other th considerations. But the answer, you know, I asked a question a while ago, could it ever be like that again? Well, yes, it could. But it's going to take a people that have that love for God with all their heart and mind and soul. It's going to take leadership, yes. It's going to take the kind of, of leader that, uh, and leaders in the church that had the, uh, say, and, I, I'm not, and I'm not saying necessarily we have to have one powerful uh, ruler over the whole church. I'm not talking about that. But I think of what it says of, of Hezekiah when it says in Second Chronicles 30, in verse 30, 20, and thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord is God. That's the type of leadership we need. You know, certainly things can be hard. There can be difficulties in serving God. God has made it that way to test our love for Him. You know, He gives us this admonition of Matthew 8. Most of us are familiar with this, but certainly it never loses its truth. It never loses its, its, the effect it has upon our life because Christ tells us in verse 13, uh, Matthew 7 and verse 13, Enter you in at the straight or the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. And brought us a way that leads unto destruction. And many there be which go there and at, because straight or narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And few there be that find it. You know, back in those days, uh, most of those cities were built upon a hill, and usually they would have a, a narrow, winding road that would work its way up to the city gate. And the gates would be closed uh, at, when it got dark in the evening. So it's a picture of working our way up that narrow path towards God's kingdom. And it isn't always easy. You can recall the situation that Paul encourages us with here in Acts, the 14th chapter. Acts 14 in verse 
22, after they had, Paul had been left for dead, back in verse 19, had been, uh, let's just read that, Acts 14 and verse 19, and there came there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They realized they had committed a crime, he was a Roman citizen, they didn't want to be responsible for taking the life of a Roman citizen without a trial. Howbeit, as the disciples stood up around about him, he rose up, he came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. He went right back. And when he had preached the gospel of that city and taught many, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Went right back to where he had been, where he had been for all practical uh, uh, considerations dead. Concerning the concern, confirming or actually strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting or encouraging them to continue in the faith, and then we through much, 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 through much tribulation or trial must enter into the kingdom of God. None of us are going to escape that. Any of us who enter into God's kingdom, it's going to be some hardships. It's going to be some difficulties. But we have Christ to be there with us. We have the comfort of His Spirit. I can do all things through Christ, as it would be the original Greek there from Philippians 4.13, who strengthens me. I remember the story of an elderly lady out one day, and she was watching some little boys. And they set up this high bar by a sand pit, and they were trying to get over, they were trying to jump over the high bar. Well, they would run up real fast and they would stop right at the bar and they were too timid to try the jump. They would lose their nerve right when they got up to the bar. And the little elderly lady was standing there for a long time. And finally, she walked over and she says, boys, she said, what you have to do is just throw your heart over that bar and your body will go with it. And one of the little boys took her advice he threw his heart over that bar, and he got over. But you know, that's exactly what King Hezekiah and David did. They threw their heart into the sacrifice and their service for God. And uh, it earned for David uh, God's commendation when it was said of him that he was a man after God's own heart. And we know that Hezekiah proved to be a second David. And I don't think there could be a better ending than simply to read again the summation of, of Hezekiah's life in 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 20. And here was a king who also was like David, a man after God's own heart. 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 20. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God. And in every work that he begun in the service of the house of God, and in the law, and in the commandments, to seek his God he did with all his heart and prospered.